Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. On this edition, we'll meet a sculptor from Western North Dakota, investigate farming in Manitoba, and listen to a band from the lumbering forest of Minnesota. An exhibit at the Becker County Museum in Detroit Lakes looks back at what it was like to be a doctor in the early to mid 20th century. The Sprafka family has donated all of the medical equipment from their family practice, and it's quickly evident that medical advancements have come a long way since then. My father started practice here in 1938, late 1938, until 1965 when he was semi-retired and then practices a little bit till 1974. Uh, it was in the basement of our house that I presently own. And uh, like at that time, there were no clinics. Uh, all the doctors or dentists had uh, their offices upstairs and apartments up, up there. And uh, this is all his equipment here. And we've had it for a number of years. He passed away in 1980. We bought the house from my mother and then we decided, why are we keeping this? Let's donate it to the Becker County Museum because then a lot of people will be able to see it and it'll be useful that way. Uh, we received a phone call from the Sprafka family asking if we'd be interested in acquiring uh, all of the items from Dr. Sprafka's medical office. And so we uh, came over and took a look at it. It was many of the items were not things we had in our collection, especially um, things like the exam table, the IV pole, we did have some medical equipment already, but it was smaller items, and so this was really an opportunity to create an exhibit that kind of showcased uh, med medicine from the past, if you will, and have a more complete display. I think the two items that probably really stand out for me are the exam table, which is beautiful wood and leather top that you just, of course, do not see in today's world, and the glass IV pole. Um, again, we're used to going in and having maybe a similar looking pole, but it's all bags and uh, disposable tubing and, and what have you, not anything that we would have put any sort of medicine in a glass bottle in today's world. Well, you're not gonna see to heat the needles and to give the shots, that's all the thing of the past. Yeah, medicine has changed a whole lot. And yet in, in many ways, it's the, there's a lot of similarities too of what they have, the benches to, to sit on, to place them up or back in a certain position where the, the doctor can give you the physical and that you need. It was a whole lot different. He did a lot of house calls. Um, probably, I don't want to say ha half, but maybe 40% of the babies were born at, in their house rather than the hospital. It was during the depression and then the early years of the war. So the people were pretty, uh, pretty hard up as far as financially during the depression. I remember him saying that many times uh, some of the farmers might come in and they didn't have money and he'd take care of them anyway. He says, well, you need medical help. And they would come back maybe a week or two weeks later with a bunch of chickens that had been killed and cleaned or, or a hind quarter of a, of a, a steer. Or he was paid that way many times, which he says is perfectly fine because we have to go to the store and get the food anyway. Sometimes it'd be early in the morning, you might get a call at five or six. His regular office hours were like from eight until five, but he'd go to the hospital and deliver babies or uh, take out an appendix for appendicitis and whatever. But yeah, he'd get called late at night. He'd be maybe come back at one o'clock in the morning. That's just the way it was. I think all of the doctors in town, people had fond memories of them. The local doctors, uh, people, had faith in them and uh, you didn't go out of town in those days. You didn't drive to Fargo. Fargo was a long ways, you know, uh, on the highway. So people went to all the doctors locally and yeah, people had fond memories of them. Dr. Long, Dr. Rutledge, quite a bit of equipment from uh, that have been 
generously donated to the museum from those families. It's been up now a month, there's just a couple months, and when we first put it up, we had uh, quite a few people in, quite a bit of traffic online in the social media world. Um, lots of people come back to the Detroit Lakes area in the summertime to do research, to visit family, to enjoy the lakes, and so quite a few comments on looking forward to coming back and seeing the exhibit, uh, not only Dr. Sprafka's items, but some of the other medical uh, equipment that we have on display. So we'll inten uh, intend to leave it up through the summer. So we've had people talk about remembering going to see Dr. Sprafka at his house or Dr. Sprafka coming to visit and um, sometimes those stories go along with maybe some financial struggles and how the families were able to pay for those visits. We had lots of feedback on uh, Facebook uh, because it was put there so yeah and then in town here I've had a lot of people say yeah they've been in and seen it on Facebook and they're really impressed with the exhibit. It's, it is a great museum for the size of city of Detroit Lakes. I think there was more time. Unfortunately, in the clinics now, they're, they, you're kind of rushed through because they're on a real tight schedule. You know, they're in and out because they've got another room down the hall that they've got a patient waiting for them, where in those days, the doctor could sit with them and talk for a while and, and uh, take more time. Part of our goal at the Becker County Museum is to kind of reinforce all of the history that people are reading and so if you're reading about something that happened back in that time era and going to the doctor or what a physician maybe would have carried with them on house calls, an exhibit is there to reinforce that information and so it kind of makes it a little more real for people. Dickinson, North Dakota bronze sculptor Linda Little is a living testament to how a life-changing event can lead to something unexpected. Following a debilitating car accident in 1996, Linda went through therapy that included learning how to sculpt. Twenty years later, her bronze sculptures are wonders to behold. So I was introduced to a class that was coming up from a teacher, Valentino Korhovo, a master from Russia. And he literally took my hands once again in his and said, I will teach these to do what this cannot. When we start out in sculpting, we have to build ourselves an armature, which generally made from metal, iron, wire. Then I take the basic form of the horse and this is what I'm going to end up with. So I'm the first step of seven. And then there are seven subcontractors that work for myself and other bronze sculptors. And the conclusion of those steps is they will pour in the 2200 degree metal and it will take the shape of the wax. Then at the very end of that, then we base a product. And in my case, I use sometimes metal, which you've seen outside here, or the wooden walnut bases. I believe part of the reason that this interview came about is because of a head trauma that I received in 1996. And prior to sculpting, my career was in purchasing, um, municipal purchasing. To make a very long story short, um, we're traveling down I-25 to DIA airport to pick up my son who had visited his stepsister. And in fact, we never made it. A young man ran a red light. I was making a left-hand turn, and he broadsided us. Um, that was life-changing. I had a family yet. I had a husband who was feeding me and did for six months. I had a son that was 15, and he could not figure out why his mother was the way she was, because there wasn't anything bleeding. There wasn't any um, bandages. All of it was internal. I found that change for me was learning a new career. There was a gentleman in um, Colorado who was accepting eight students who, God bless him, accepted me as his student. And actually what has happened, it's like 
all professions. Once we become used to doing something, it becomes a matter of just doing it. We don't think about it. And in some cases, that's what happens now. My hands will work and my mind doesn't have to engage. I made a phone call. I understood that there was a veterans project going to happen in Dickinson, North Dakota, and said that I would be interested in volunteering on the board to gather funds in the community. Would I be invited to the meeting? And she said, of course, we'd love for you to come. I came to the meeting, and it ended up that they asked me if I'd be interested in presenting uh, design work for the project. And I said, of course I would. When I asked my husband, the highest form of um, respect would be a salute. I told her that uh, when she was talking about doing the, that, that I didn't want any part of another war memorial where they had the people kneeling down, looked like they just got lost or got their butts whipped. When she came up with this, I said, this is wonderful. You got, uh, you got somebody actually paying tribute to the soldiers rather than somebody sitting there looking like they've just been whipped. I admire my husband um, for the fact that he has gone to Vietnam two tours back to back and also was in Desert Storm for a year. That to me is a true warrior. I wanted to honor my husband so I found photographs of him coming home from Vietnam and I used his face in the project and my son, I used his hands. I was contracted by two families here in Dickinson. They approached me and asked me if I would consider doing a TR bust. And I said, absolutely yes. And I suggested perhaps a bust. And they loved the idea and gave me complete creative freedom, and halfway into the process they reviewed it, liked it, and it was accepted, and several months later we bronzed the project and it now has found its home in the Dickinson Foundation. An angelic piece today, particularly um, this one, the simple touch would be one that I would, um, she actually is my most favorite. My husband has said that he thinks that's my masterpiece. I feel a big responsibility for, as an individual that has survived a traumatic injury, that there is something that we can do, and I'm very fortunate that I have my limbs and my hands, and I've seen incredible people work with less that have done phenomenal things. So I go on record to suggest to people that it's very important that we keep the arts alive and well. So I am truly privileged. I believe that um, God allowed the bump on my head so I could be who he intended me to be. Manitoba has some of the most fertile soil in the world, but farmers still have to be attentive to their crops. They work long hours during the limited growing season with hopes of a great harvest. Here's a segment from Prairie Public's documentary series, Built on Agriculture. Ten thousand years ago, we would have been at the bottom of Old Lake Agassiz, and that's really sort of the base on which our soils in the Red River Valley have formed. We're living and working and farming on old lake bottom sediments, sediments that are really rich in clay. And these have lots and lots of nutrients. They can hold lots and lots of water, but man, they can be difficult sometimes because water doesn't flow through them very easily. They're very sticky when they're wet, but very productive, fertile soils. I'm Jim Jansen, and we're in St. Francis Xavier, Manitoba. We operate Windy Creek Farms. It's a family uh, farm operation. We are growing canola, red spring wheat, and soybeans. Yeah, here in Manitoba, we have a very short window. Our 110 to 120 day growing season. 
you got to return a lot of the money back into the farm. Be careful on how much you take out personally. You have to be satisfied at some times with not very much. And after you've lost money per acre, it takes a while to get that back. The crop that we have this year is quite timely. After two tough years, a third one would not have worked very well for us. There's nobody that has control over the markets. There are factors throughout the world that affect everything that we grow is affected by worldwide circumstances. So, I mean, I, I find it interesting and challenging. Am I the world's greatest marketer? No. Uh, is it a game? You might think it is. People say if you're not growing, you're, you're not moving forward. We've come to a point in our operation, we've stayed around the 6,400 acres for the last 12 plus years. We're comfortable at that level, and instead of expanding, I would like to do a better job on those acres. Definitely farming is a business. There's just too much money involved. Yeah, I mean, there is a lifestyle. Nobody tells me when to get up in the morning or when to punch in or when to quit. That's up to me. And if you can't deal with that, if you need some supervision, <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably not gonna work. It's, it's not for everybody, but the field is open. You can always buy a farm somewhere. Farmers by nature, by their existence, they, they risk. They, I've yet to meet a farmer that fails to understand what risk is all about. Anybody that invests a lot of money and throws of, uh, all of the products that they buy onto the soil uh, with the great hope of reaping something from that is a risk taker. Farmers minimize their risk through knowledge and through active testing on their own. There's an old saying in risk management, if, if you don't manage your risks, they can very well end up managing you. It's a leap of faith to go into business uh, on your own, and farming is absolutely that. There are a lot of moving parts in developing an appropriate crop in an appropriate way without having an impact on the environment or your land base. Every year is an unknown. I'm Cam Henry. You're in Oak River, Manitoba, which is on the western side of the province and a little bit north of Transcanada. I'm a farmer and in the farming context uh, we're in the seed business. So we grow, process and retail seed. Uh, we're what you call in Manitoba Century Farm. So we go back to the uh, early 1880s. So my grandfather was here first, my dad, myself, and now my daughter and uh, son-in-law are farming with us. When I was young, I started in terrible times. I started in the late 60s. It was terrible times. We weren't making any money at all. And yet I saw nothing but opportunity. You know, and now we're in very good times. And when I'm looking around, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the pitfalls. Eh? You know, just as you get older, you get a little more conservative. And you, get a little, you don't have as much time to catch up if you make a major mistake. In agriculture, as the more acres you apply to grain farming, the cost per acre to seed them of input costs is the same. So much fertilizer per acre, so much spray, so much seed, those things are the same, whether you've got 100 acres or 1,000 acres or 10,000 acres. So you, you do put a lot of money out there at risk if the world turns against you. And the one thing that farming does have is it, it, you have to be willing to take risk. The biggest factor that affects how well my farm produces is the weather, and I can't control it. That's a tough game to be in. If the biggest influencing factor you can't control. Hardwood Groove has strong roots in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Even their name derives from the dense forests that populate the terrain. Their music style ranges from bluegrass and folk to jazz and rock. Here's a chance to enjoy some of their favorite original tunes. <laughs> Becker County where the springtime 
sun sends my blues over the hill. The next thing I know, those leaves are falling on the frozen ground across Minnesota in the cold north wind covers me in snow again. Yeah, you never know and what you got might be gone and you can't say that your life will be long and you can't see too far ahead of me. Watching you shine underneath the stars when you looked at me Held out those arms you said, baby, I will not leave your side in the morning light when you looked at me you said goodbye to this day honey i don't know why yeah you never know and what you got might be gone and you can't say that your life will be long and you can't see too far ahead of me so take your time, live your life, cause like this song, it's here and gone. came flowing a simple truth that became my everything suddenly she's as tall as me in shades of color i'd never seen i watched as she danced away with the breeze yeah That your life will be long and you can't see too far ahead of me. I was fishing with my dad around Detroit lakes when my face was young. And I made no mistakes and the waves roll up, but they don't bring you down. said boy come soon i don't think he will see another day yeah you never know and what you got might be gone and you can't say that your life will be long and you can't see too far ahead of me so take the time live your Cause like this song is here and gone
If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.